God bless you, Fair Havens. Amen, amen, amen. So when I say it's kind of a part two, we're just going to continue with our study in the book of 2 Corinthians. And so if you'll allow me to pray for this portion of our service, and it has been a blessed service uh, to this point, uh, we definitely feel God's presence and are grateful for his presence and the ministry of his Holy Spirit in this place. So Father God, we just give you glory, we give you praise, we give you honor. Right now, as we open up your word, Father God, I pray that you would just use me as an instrument, Lord my God, of your righteousness, Father God, to bring forth your word, Lord. I pray for each soul here in the hearing of my voice, Lord, that the truth of your word may take root, Father God, and bring forth fruit in due season. Just praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So we are actually still in chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians. We're going to pick it up on verse 14. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. And the word of God reads as follows. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does the believer share with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And I'll stop there for now. When I initially read this portion of scripture, I was reminded of a time in high school where I came across a book, a very difficult book, that had a very similar structure. You know, I loved reading as a kid. I really read anything I could get my hands on, anything with sci-fi, science fiction, or fantasy. Um, I consumed it ravenously. Whatever I could get my hands on, I just read I would even go to the library after school for fun. I was one of those kids. Kind of a loner by nature. The library kind of suited my temperament. And even in high school, my high school teachers really chose pretty cool and interesting books for us to read until Mrs. Smith, 11th grade English. And she chose this book for us. Well, Mrs. Smith was pretty young. She was a brand new teacher right out of college. And she kind of had a hard time connecting with us inner city youths. And she chose for us a book by Charles Dickens. And I normally like Charles Dickens, but I couldn't get through this one, A Tale of Two Cities. And I can still remember the first couple of lines. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was a spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct another way. And at this point, I would usually fall asleep in my reading of A Tale of Two Cities. I think this is probably the only course I failed in high school. I just couldn't get through it. But I kind of see a parallel between the verses I read in Second Corinthians and the opening verses of uh, Charles Dickens. We see two polar extremes. In Charles Dickens, he talks about the French aristocracy during the time of the French Revolution. In stark contrast to the poor people of France. So two very, very different uh, experiences during the same time. Here in 2 Corinthians, we are seeing also two very stark contrasts between children of God and children of the world. We see a contrast between righteousness and lawlessness, between light and dark, between Christ and Belial, a.k.a. Satan, between believers and unbelievers, and the temple of God with idols. 
Now I ask myself, what do we do when we come across difficult passages in the Bible? Because some might consider this a particularly difficult passage. Some might say that these particular verses are intolerant. They're judgmental. They're judgmental. They're isolationist. They might contradict some of the other verses of the Bible that talks about opening your heart in love, which we talked about last week. Expand your heart. Stretch your heart to love those around you. Yet here we're saying that the Lord is saying, do not be unequally yoked. Could you show that first? We'll get to that in a second, because I want to kind of dive into what does it mean to be unequally yoked. But first I want to address that question. What do we do? What is our response as Christians when we get to a difficult portion of Scripture? And very many portions of Scripture are difficult for whatever reason. Because it just doesn't jive with the way I was raised. It just doesn't jive with what social media is telling me. It doesn't jive with the current cultural trends. Yet, we have to be biblical in our approach to Scripture, above all things. And we have to really understand what is it that you believe about the Bible as a whole. We know that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God or woman of God may be complete and equipped for every work. So when we come across Scripture that might be a bit challenging, we still need to approach it with reverence and fear and trembling. Understanding that God placed it there for our benefit, for our edification, for the edification of the church. And as I was laying in my bed on Friday night, early Friday morning, with a touch of insomnia, just thinking about this message, I began to think about the five solas of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. You may not have heard of this before, so let me just break it down for you. During the 1500s or so, 1600s, there were people who were standing up against some of the teachings of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was saying, in order to be saved, you must do this, you must do that, you must do the other. The Catholic Church was saying that the Pope's words were ultimate in supremacy. The Pope's words would go on top of the Bible. So these men, like Martin Luther, to name one, I won't name a few, I'll just name one, kind of began to protest. That's where we get the Protestant Reformation. They were kind of protesting against a lot of the teachings of the Catholic Church. And they came up with five solas. Sola is Latin word for only. So these five things that we need to base and ground our belief on, our belief system on, but also what we ground our salvation on. The first one is sola scriptura, the word of God alone. The word of God alone. The word of God is inerrant, infallible. In all other writings, everything must be subjected to and amended to the word of God. Even if I here, as a minister of the word of God, say something, I want you to judge what I say according to scripture. Because my words have to submit to scripture. Many, many false teachings throughout history come around because of poor understanding of this, this idea, this concept. Yet people who, like during the Protestant Reformation, uh, people understood what the Word of God says about itself, about its inerrancy, about its authority, about its utility, what is it used for? And again, I'll say, like we read in uh, 2 Timothy, it is good for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All of the scripture. We cannot pick and choose. 
and overlook because it doesn't align with what I believe in the 21st century America. We can't pick and choose and edit to suit our liking or to tickle our ears. So that primary one, the sola scriptura, is so, so important because how we believe the Bible, how we interpret the Bible, the value we give the Bible, upon that rests everything else we do as Christians. And just briefly, I'll go through the other five because there's five. There's um, sola Christ, solus Christus, basically Christ alone. Salvation is only through Christ alone. He's the only mediator be between God and man. We are saved through faith alone. Not by works, but by faith in Jesus Christ's completed work. Amen. We are saved through grace alone. It is a free gift that God has given all of humanity. And to God's glory alone. To him be the glory. And that was, again, in stark contrast to the things that the Catholic Church was teaching in that time. And unfortunately, sometimes continues to teach till today. But those are teachings for another day. So again, we cannot pick and choose Scripture even when Scripture kind of rubs against us. If you are confronted with a Scripture that rubs against you, pay attention. Because God is using that to form, to shape, to rebuke, to reproof. So that we can conform our lives according to His Word. So what I want to do now is just kind of help us understand what are these verses saying and what are they not saying? Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with unrighteousness or lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Satan? What portion does a believer have with the unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? So you see this picture here. We are not an agrarian society anymore. Meaning we don't, our, our, our primary economy is not based in agriculture or farming. As it was during the times the Bible was written. People who read this originally understood this concept clearly. Very clearly. The piece of wood you see on the animal's shoulder, that is called the yoke. And typically when I'm plowing fields, I will choose two animals of equal size and equal strength in order to begin to plow the fields, to, be, to help it be prepared for planting of seeds. Here's what I'm, here what I'm saying. You use that, and you, they, they drag this very heavy wooden thing with a hook, and it breaks up the ground so that you can begin to plant seeds. And the farmers during that time, again, I'm not a farmer, I'm a city boy myself, but... The farmers in that time would make sure that they had two animals that were equal size and equal strength to go and plow the fields in order to maximize efficiency, to make sure that the crops are healthy. Because if we don't have animals that are of equal yoke, equal strength or equally yoked, you see this type of uh, discrepancy here, this difference here the lines are going to be crooked because the stronger one will kind of lead to the left a little bit or lead to the right a little bit. And instead of having straight lines, you're going to have circles. But then you also have an uneven wearing down of the beasts of burden because the stronger one will tend to try to pick up the slack and he will be or she will be worn down faster than the, the partner. So God is saying here, through the Apostle Paul, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. We, we need to understand that there are certain things that lie completely outside of the range of Christianity. Idolatry is number one. Making anything, putting anything in the place of God is a form of idolatry. In some countries, we see people, or some religious practices, we see people literally bowing down to statues made by human hands. That's idolatry in a surface level. But if we dig deeper, we can see that idolatry can take many, many forms. And I've spoken about that from this pulpit before. 
Whatever you give top priority to, whatever you place in God's rightful place in your life becomes an idol. That could be your job, that could be money, that could be power, that could be fame, that could be sex. It could even be your children. It could be your wife. Idolatry takes many places. The, the point is, God is supreme above all. And the Bible is clear that he's a jealous God and he will, have, he will take place second fiddle to none. So if God is not number one in your life, Examine yourself. So idolatry goes completely outside of the realm of Christianity, Christian belief. Living a life that is patterned by sin, vices, licentiousness, anything that has control over your life, that dominates you. Because we are supposed to be dominated by and led by the Holy Spirit. If we're not spirit-led and spirit-filled, something else is going to be dominating you. Dishonesty, deception, fraud. Doing things for your own personal gain. We're talking about like business practices. Embezzlement. Those things go are outside of the realm of what is expected of a person who is uh, professing to be Christian. It goes against the Christian lifestyle. And also pursuing, again, pursuing pleasures of the flesh that go outside of God's ordination of marriage between man and woman. Those things also kind of fall outside of Christianity. So he's saying here, do not be unequally yoked. Do not be tied to, linked to. These animals here, were joined for the duration of their time in the field. So we're not talking about, we're not talking here about, you know, going to a business and buying something from a person who's not a Christian. We're talking about entering into partnership with someone. Because the deal is, if you have a set of principles that is based on the Bible, and that person has a set of principles that's based on whatever else, your outcomes, your efforts are going to be lopsided. That's why he's saying do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. In matters where it kind of takes you working together to try to meet uh, an end goal. Think about marriage. Okay? Uh, so for those of us who are, so those of you, I'm, I can't say us because I'm married. For those of you who are still um, single and are looking for your life partner, keep this in mind. Please keep this in mind. You don't want to be unequally yoked with a non-believer because you are, again, think about how are you going to raise your child? How are you going to manage your finances? How are you going to manage a household? If you have a set of principles and ideals and the other person has a set of principles and ideas that goes contrary to that which you hold to be true. What it is not saying, though, if you have two people who are unbelievers and one of them converts, please hear me, the Bible says this as well. It is not saying you need to leave your spouse. No, you stay there. You continue to pray for your spouse. And through your obedience to the Lord, through your example, through your testimony, Lord willing, your spouse will also be saved. But it's saying here, do not willingly, knowingly, enter into a partnership, a long-term working relationship with someone who doesn't have the same ideals as you, morals as you, vision as you, doesn't have the same God as you because of the consequences that will come afterwards. So this is a warning. And as all warnings, you can take it or leave it. But again, this is also not talking about, like I said, like just business transactions and doing business with um, people who may not be Christian. It's not also talking about withholding love and affection from family members who are not Christian. Absolutely not. We are to freely 
give our love to our relatives, even if they are not saved, especially if they're not saved. We are to freely give our love to our neighbors if they're not saved, especially if they're not saved. This is not saying that we should relinquish our duties as citizens of this nation. Or this is not saying that we should relinquish our desire to do good for our communities. We have seen, though, people who have taken these verses, unfortunately, and they've used it as an excuse to separate themselves from the world. They refuse to interact with the world around them. That's not what this is saying here. I've even heard where people uh, will not even go to movie theaters because the Bible says, do not sit in the seat of scoffers. They kind of take it to an extreme. But the Bible clearly says that we are supposed to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We're supposed to go out into the world and make disciples. Preaching the gospel and making disciples. So we're not supposed to separate ourselves from the world. We're supposed to be the love of Christ physically in this world. But this warning here is about entering into that kind of relationship when I have to work side by side with someone for a prolonged period of time to accomplish some type of a project, whether it be in business or marriage. That's what we're talking about here. So what are our implications? What, what does this mean for us? Remember what I said uh, in a previous message. When we're reading the Bible, be careful for words like therefore or for. And we come across a for at the end of chapter, uh, verse 6. So let's go back to, I'm sorry, verse 16, 616. I'm going to start with the beginning of 16, and we're going to get to that four. So everything that goes before this four, F-O-R, not F-O-U-R, four, gives us the warning. What comes after gives us the reason why. This is the because. What agreement has the temple of God with the idol? For or because. Therefore, we are the temple of the living God. We are the temple of the living God. This is why we cannot enter into being yoked with someone who is an unbeliever because we are the temple of a living God. He says, the Lord says, and Paul is quoting other scripture, I will make my dwelling among them and I will walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. Do not touch any unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. And I will be your father, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. Let's not be mistaken, brothers and sisters, that God has called us, just like he called Abraham out of the people that he lived in, in the Earl of the Chaldees. Just as he called Abraham out of those people. He's also calling Christians to come out of the world. And it's kind of a, 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 a paradox because he says, you have to be in the world, but be not of it. What that means is, it's all about your mindset. It's all about your worldview. Yes, we have no choice but to live in this world. But we cannot allow the world to dictate how we think, how we speak, how we act. All that we do as Christians, our mind has to be transformed according to the word. And listen to this. My mind, what I think, is based on what I know. What I know is based on what I read. So careful what you read. Careful what you listen to. Careful what you watch. Those things will change your thinking. Goes into your mind, you begin to think about certain things. You begin to think and reflect on certain things it begins to form beliefs and attitudes. And out of those beliefs and attitudes comes actions. We read last week 
that all things have passed away and all things have been made new. So when he's talking about that, he's talking about wanting to make us new, to transform us into the image and likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. Because he wants us to be in heaven with him when we take our last breath here on earth. Amen. But heaven is, a, heaven is a holy place. And nothing impure can enter it. And thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Because on my own, like I said, on my own, on my own, I cannot save myself. On my own, I'm not righteous enough. I'm not good enough. But Christ was, and Christ is, and Christ will forever be. And it is by his blood that we have entry. By his blood, again, like I said, from the five solos of the, the, the Reformation. By Christ alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, which is by grace alone, to the glory of God alone. So remember what God has taken us out of. Remember that what God has saved us from. Remember, I said, we cannot overlook or cover up difficult scripture. And I'm going to give you some difficult scripture right now. Because I'm trying to drive a point home. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Or do you not know that unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? Unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God. Apart from the blood of Christ, we are all unrighteous. With the blood of Christ applied to us, we are just as righteous as Christ. And thank God for that. He says, Do not be deceived. Again, what I'm going to say here are tough words. But it is for our edification, for our correction, for our teaching. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, or those who practice homosexuality, or thieves, or greedy, nor drunkards, or revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But listen to this. And such were some of you. And such were some of you. Listen to the hope that comes after. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We can each, each of us, in one way or another, or another can identify ourselves in that list somehow. Maybe more than once or twice. Who knows? God knows. But it is by the blood of Christ that we are saved. By the blood of Christ that we are no longer, God no longer sees me as a vile sinner. He no longer sees me as unrighteous, but he sees the righteousness of Christ in me or upon me. Because Jesus Christ took all that vile sin upon himself. First Peter 3, 13 through 16 says, Therefore, preparing your minds in, for action, be sober-minded and set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Before we came to the Lord, before Christ saved us, we walked around in ignorance thinking that which we were doing was fine. But then the Holy Spirit got a hold of us. The Holy Spirit convicted us of our sins and made us fall to our knees. And even God himself gives us the gift of faith to believe. And I have the belief that faith in Christ's finished work on the cross. So do not be conformed by the passions of your former ignorance. But as he has called you, is holy, you are to also be holy in your con conduct. Since it, it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So yes, the minute we have that saving faith in Christ, we are holy before God's eyes. We are completely holy and righteous in, in front of God's eyes. But if God 
feels, sees fit to continue to give you breath after that point, we have to enter into a time, a period where we begin to conform our lives to begin to be more and more like Jesus Christ. Where he sheds ourselves of ourselves and we take on more of his likeness, his righteousness. That, my friends, is a lifelong process. None of us have gotten there yet. The only time we, we will get to that place is when we take our last breath or until Christ comes for his church. It is a lifelong pro process of progressive sanctification. So now, knowing where we came from, knowing how weak we are, knowing how weak our flesh is and how much of a temptation our flesh can want to go back to the things that God saved us from. This is why he's saying, do not be unequally yoked with the unbelievers. You're not strong enough. If Christ saved you from X, stay away from X. If Christ saved you from B, whatever it might be, you're not strong enough to resist it on your own. Don't play with fire because you will get burned, my friends. We're not strong enough. Thank God for his Holy Spirit. Thank God for his Holy Spirit because he gives us the strength to resist. But again, be very careful that some things he says resist, but some things he says run from. You need to know the difference. There's wisdom in that. So he says also 33. Um, this is in 2 Corinthians. I don't have, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians. Don't know the chapter, but it's verse 33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God, and it is to your shame. Again, it is a warning to us. Yes, we are to be the salt of the earth, light of the world. Yes, we are supposed to open up our hearts and love on people and love on people and love on people and even love some more. Just like that Bible reference I read last week, uh, last week speaking about Paul's heart, it's as if it had a, like infinite elasticity. It just kept stretching and stretching and stretching to no end. That's the love of God. That's the heart of God. God's heart has no limits in love that he can demonstrate to his people. That's the same kind of love he wants us to love the world with. But God is also a very practical and pragmatic God. And he understands how men and women operate. He understands our weaknesses. He understands our limitations. And he understands that we have an enemy who would love to see us falling back into the things that the Lord has saved us from. So again, these are all warnings that the Lord places in front of us. Do not be unequally yoked with the unbeliever. For what partnership has righteousness with, unri with unrighteous or lawlessness? What fellowship does light have with darkness? If you're a child of the light... Stay in the light. Yes, we need to walk in the darkness, but you shouldn't be part of that darkness. We need to shine light in that darkness and not let that darkness consume you and enter into you. Because I've seen it over and over and over and over again, without a doubt, it's, you know. We see a young couple who, you know, see each other from across the, the way and they're attracted to each other. One of them is a Christian, one of them is not. And inevitably, one says, oh, I can work on him or I can work on her. And lo and behold, in my experience, in my, I don't have great, great experiences, but in my experiences, it's typical that the Christian person will compromise their values and their beliefs and begin to walk away from their God. So this is why this is here. 
God is calling you as a father. He's saying, I will welcome you. I will be your father. You will be my sons and my daughters. Be separate from them. Be separate from them. In closing, I want to give you an illustration of something that happened in my household last Saturday, last, last Saturday, I believe it was. I told you we had the grandkids over and we were playing hide and seek. And little Elijah, he, you'll see him running around later. He says, I found the perfect place to hide, Guero. And he goes underneath this clear plastic bin as my wife was kind of putting away some decorations. Like that is the best hiding place, brother. Your sister will have no problem finding you at all. But the point is, as we kind of do the same thing with God, don't we? Oh God, I'm gonna. I I I don't want you to see what I'm doing. I don't. I I don't. I I gotta fix myself before I come to church. I have to fix myself before I come to you or before I give my my life to you. He sees it all. He sees it all. And it's a sweet little illustration, but it's a really poignant illustration because we act very much the same way in trying to hide or keep things from God. That list that I read from 1 Corinthians 9, 6, 9, like I said, tough scriptures. We will be called intolerant. We will be called bigoted. We will be called all types of things in standing up for our Christian values. But God is a loving God. And there's absolutely nothing that we can do that he doesn't know that we've already done anyway. All we need to do is have faith that his, the blood of Christ applied to our sins will cover our sins. So do not approach God in a way that I'm trying, you know, you, you think you can hide from God because you cannot. But today God is calling. God is calling you to come out from there. And now I'm talking to anybody who may not consider themselves a Christian. One who has not placed saving faith in Jesus Christ. Christ is calling you out from that place. And he's saying, I, I love just to go back to the scripture. I will make a dwelling place among you. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separated to them, says the Lord. Do not touch any unclean thing and I will welcome you. I will be your father and you will be my son. You'll be my daughter, says the Lord Almighty. We serve a loving God, brothers and sisters. We serve a loving God. And his mercy endures forever. And there's absolutely nothing that you can do nor I can do to earn it, to achieve it, to deserve it. Nothing. It's a free gift. That's why I always meditate on the, the solos of the Reformation every, you know, so often. To remind myself that my salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It is a free gift of God. And it is through Christ's blood to God's glory alone. Simple, the end. So, my friends, if you haven't had that opportunity to come to saving faith in Christ, but you feel that God is moving in your hearts, that his word has spoken to you today, I want to pray for you. And if after service, you need someone to talk to, talk this about, or talk this over with, we'll be here. We have ministers and pastors who would love to, to sit and chat with you. But I'll let me pray for you. Father God, I give you thanks for your word. I give you thanks because your word, my God, is truth. Your word not only is truth, but it is life, Lord. Lord, your word is our daily bread through which we get sustenance in life. I thank you, my God, because your word cuts 
like a double-edged sword reaching to sinew and marrow, Father God. That it touches even the parts of our soul that we try to hide from you, Father God. But you see it all. And in spite of seeing it all, and in spite of seeing all of our damaged goods, all of our wretchedness, all of our sin, you still have a great love for us, Father God. That love that compelled your son to come down to this earth to die for our sins. And Father God, I just pray for anyone who does not know you. I pray, my God, that you would give them the faith to believe. To believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That it is all done. It is all finished. That because of his sinless life, I can now live the life that you've called us to live. That the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And now we no longer are slaves to sin. But we can resist the devil and he will flee. Father God, we give you praise and I thank you, my God, for these people who might just be coming to saving faith in you, Lord. I pray, my God, that your spirit continue to minister, that they may continue to grow and, and, and mature in you, that they may begin to know you more and more through your word. Holy Spirit, continue to reveal yourself through your word. And to the rest of the, the, rest of the congregation, I just pray blessings. I pray, my God, that even those who have been in this walk for decades will still be able to find the joy and the love of your word. That every day when we open up our, your word, we can find new truths. And that those truths will just transform us more and more into the image and likeness of your son, Jesus Christ. And to the congregation, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. You're dismissed.